Hi, um, I'm Jessica Brillhart. I'm the principal filmmaker for virtual reality at Google. Um, and uh, first of all, thanks to OPME and Tribeca Film Institute for inviting me. It's really awesome to be here and to talk to you kind of very quickly and briefly about uh, some of the insights that I've been finding um, by working as a filmmaker uh, in, in VR. Um, so I'm gonna just go for it. Uh, I'm gonna start with this. Um, this is a frame. Um, and, uh, you know, for a lot of you who are filmmakers or just people who enjoy film, um, this is sort of how we've been enjoying film for a very long time and how we've been crafting for film for a very long time. Um, so you have, you know, a great scene for the good, bad, and the ugly. And, and the cool thing is we can just kind of sit back and just enjoy something. A really well-crafted frame is something remarkable. Um, and, uh, yeah, and so you're able to craft for it. You'll be able to see what the director wants you to see. So there's really no reason for you to do this to turn away from it, right? If you do that, you, I mean, that's not what the medium wants, it's not what it's trying to do. Uh, but VR um, gives you the ability to do that. Not only does it, does it give you the ability, it embraces that as part of the medium. Um, so the frame is a bit of a weird way of framing VR. Um, I actually prefer to see it um, like this, um, which is a world that we build. And um, the way that I kind of distill this crazy that I've been learning uh, is by taking a world, so I think of it as like, okay, when I film, I create this world, I film this world, um, I put someone in it, and then that person has uh, agency, uh, either by just looking, by engaging with in some other way, um, and then I get to this. Um, and this is how I've been kind of diagramming out a lot of what I've been finding. Uh, if anything, just to make it easier for me to know what the heck's going on. Um, and, and how I got there was also kind of interesting too. So um, I came to a point where I had to edit some virtual reality captured live action footage together. And at the time, which was a year ago, which I guess is like, I don't know, 20 years in VR, I, according to what's been going on right now, um, I, I basically was, was tasked with this with this you know, thing where I have to like, okay, I have to edit these different stitches together, I have to edit these different worlds together. But I was editing it like this, which is frame to frame to frame, because that was what I was used to, right? Um, but uh, it was wrong. And when I actually went and I looked at it in a headset, it, was, it looked like complete crap. And everyone knew it, and I knew it. And I was like, well, maybe editing is impossible in VR, maybe this isn't gonna actually happen. But what I was getting wrong was that I was considering it the way that I showed you earlier. I was seeing it as premeditated frames, things that I was interested in, without in any way regarding the viewer's perception, what they are gonna actually be looking at. So what I really should have been doing is this. Which is really just seeing it as worlds that we build on top of other worlds. You know, worlds that extend from each other, that revolve around each other. And what I really do as a creator is I need to find a way to help the viewer tunnel through this universe that I've created, which is crazy. And it's, like, gives me anxiety just looking at that. Um, so um, I've got a theory, and I'm gonna show you it now. It's called probabilistic experiential editing. Um, and it has a really unfortunate acronym. And uh, <laughs> I'm not, you know, I, I'm trying, okay. Um, I tried to change it to this. Uh, but it's too late, I think. Um, so probably it's experiential editing. So it's three parts. I'm going to go through each of these uh, uh, today. Uh, attention. So um, we usually follow the red dot, right? We, like, we kind of see where it goes, see where it takes us. Um, and, and in VR, generally, what we've been calling these are points of interest or POIs. And, uh, you know, in something like this, you know, attention points are given to us. We're told what to look at, we're told what to pay attention to, and we take it. Uh, but in VR, uh, we don't have that. We can look anywhere. Um, but then you have to sort of evaluate, well, where in that experience could I look? Where are people gravitating towards? Um, and then from there, you can actually start to get a better understanding of, well, then how do I go to the next world? How do I understand what it is that, that someone's going to actually experience in this world? Um, and so, uh, taking the glacier climber here, uh, you basically have one guy scaling a glacier in a landscape of glacier, right? And he's the only one making a sound, he's the only one moving, so I can make a pretty good bet that someone's going to be looking at him. An important thing to note is that there is no guarantee of that. Even if I put arrows pointing at him, 
a trombone player. Like, it would not do a lick of good. It, all it takes is someone to look away from that to make that a moot point. I can't rely on that, but I can make a strong bet with that. Um, but then it starts to get complicated, right? Like, experiences aren't that simple. You just don't, like, show up and there's one person that you see in the distance and you get it. It's like, you know, it's a crowded subway car. It's a cafe. Um, it's a tram. And uh, so here we actually have a lot of potentials of uh, attention points or POIs. Um, and don't get me started about rocks. <laughs> it's, utter, uh, it's utter chaos. So, um, so then we have to really think about engagement. It's not so much what, it's how. And eventually why, but let's just start with how. Um, because once you take that red dot and you do this, or you do this, or you do this, or you do this, then it becomes a question of why are we experiencing it the way that we do? How are we experiencing this thing? And then, then we start to actually start coordinating where are people are actually going to be looking, but, but like how is that engagement going to, to transpire? Um, so let's go to the editing part now. Backtracking slightly, say we have Glacier Climber dude. Uh, I, can take a, I can make a pretty strong bet that he, you're going to be uh, looking at him. Um, but then I can do something really interesting. I could basically say, okay, I know you're going to look at him. And I call this a match on attention, so it's like a match cut, but just on an attention point, right? Match on attention. Uh, I'm looking at a point, I'm compelled to look somewhere, and then in the next world, I can do this, which is basically just match what you are looking at with something that I would like you to look at in the next world. Again, there's no guarantee, but I can place pretty good bets or solid bets that um, the probability of you being in that area is, is pretty strong. So I can actually get you to see something that I want you to see purely by identifying that point. Um, but then you get something, oh, sorry, I'll show you this. Uh, what about this one instead? There you go. So you're looking at the glacier climber in that, and then you're looking at the radio in the tram following it. It could be anything. I could have decided, okay, I want you to look out a window in the next shot, or I want to look at you to look at her, or I want you to look at this guy over here. And the thing that's really interesting about attention points and the way that we move through a space too, which I'll also get to a little bit, is that um, because you're kind of the camera in this space, if you go from one attention point to another, you're essentially creating a camera move, right? I see the speaker, what's coming out of the speaker, I go to her, I start to explore, and suddenly you have uh, this moving frame from the viewer that explores the space and reveals things to, uh, to that person. Uh, so what about if you have four, uh, four things here? And so something to, to recognize, there's a, there's a difference between looking at something and looking through something. So when you look at a film, you're generally looking if, if the film is of a window, which is weird, but if you do. So you look at a window, but if you're in a space, you look through it at something else. So there's engagement beyond just the plain attention, right? It's not the what, it's the how. Um, so this is just a very uh, basic understanding of that space. There's four windows. Um, and I call this tunneling because I'm a nerd and uh, quantum tunneling is pretty cool, so I kind of think of it like that a little bit. Um, but if you think of it this way, um, in, the, in this situation, I essentially want to allow for a viewer to move through worlds based on their engagement. So in this one, um, I could do something like extend it. So if I know you're looking through something, I can then say, okay, in the next world, I'm going to match it with something where you're also going to be looking through it. So it extends it beyond that one scene. Um, and then there I have the new world. So uh, in the tram scene, if you're looking through the front or the back windows, spoiler alert, I guess, but um, it, it extends it through this, uh, I guess, hallway in a horse stable. So I'll uh, see, let you guys see that again. It's kind of weird to go like this, but whatever. Um, and then you look down a horse stable. So it, it extends it, right? So I'm engaging in the space a certain way, and then the next cut uh, acknowledges that I'm ex engaging in that way and then, and then respects that and uh, continues that. Um, but then let's think about another way we can do that, which is respond to it, which to me is less like, I'm just gonna give you something else I want you to see. It's more like, no, I see how you, I understand how you may be engaging with this, so I'm gonna reach out a hand and pull you through. Um, and so it's a little bit different. It's more like a, a response than, than an extension. So, come on, great. If you look out uh, the left or the right windows in the tram, uh, you get a horse face that looks back at you. Which you can tell if it works because people like yelp pretty, 
pretty, uh, pretty loudly. Um, and there are a couple other insights too. So once you start really thinking about attention points and how people engage with the experience, then you start thinking a bit broader about it. Uh, people call this all sorts of things. I call it onboarding, just because why not? It's going to change in a year, so whatever. But um, the, uh, basically, people still don't really get VR, right? Like they put on a kind of awkward headset or they put on a piece of cardboard or, or whatever, and they're basically spending the first couple, like 30 seconds, probably more, going like, what is this thing? And they, don't, they have no idea. Um, and so you want to acknowledge that. I still do that in a Vive. I'm so used to filming things like 360 films that um, once again is something that's actually positional that I can move through. I actually need a hot second to know that I can do this, which is you know, embarrassing, but I do that. You know, and I know that I do that. So in, in World Tour, which is the first film um, that I did, I actually, what I do is I start with, with the rocks, that, that chaos, the utter chaos scene. <laughs> Because there's nothing expected of the viewer. There's no, you don't have to look at anything. You can just be there for a second. Orient yourself. Understand that you're in a new space. It's fine. Take it easy. Um, and then the following shot is actually the glacier shot. And um, the great thing about spatial audio is you can use audio as triggers to know where to sort of look or pay attention to. So generally, I mean, my thinking is you're going to be here and you're going to be like, what is this? And then you're going to hear something behind you and then you're going to turn. Right? And so that coordination is just thinking about like what ways can I do like first putting the headset and now I want you to understand that you can actually move through the space. Um, another thing is discovery. Uh, I think it's generally, I mean, I'm a huge Mist fan, so I always say that at every talk because I am. Um, but I mean, it's the idea that I don't necessarily, I can, I can discover things. I don't need to be presented things all the time. Sometimes it's important, but other times I'd actually rather just discover things on my own. Um, and so what you can do in this situation, you can see it over here, I can get, if I can generally understand where someone's going to be paying attention, I can then slightly sneak in something cool on the side. And if they don't see it, fine. But if they do, awesome. Or maybe if I actually want that to be something that's a little bit more pronounced, I can add audio, I can add light, color changes, whatever, to kind of make it. I mean, you recognize that the more obvious you are, the sillier it's going to feel, right? Like the trombone thing you think is funny, but that's actually what people do kind of weirdly in other ways. Um, and then uh, another thing, too, is uh, training. Uh, so if I have a, a whole booklet of this. You should see the circles before. They were pretty solid shapes. Um, but um, I, I made a film called Resonance, and what I did was I was exploring this idea of, like, can you train a viewer to rely on a particular visual that then as you move through a space or through an experience, um, that particular visual can unlock different parts of the experience. So I have this uh, violinist, Tim Fain, who's amazing, uh, who uh, walks around you and walks around the space. Um, at the beginning, you look for him, and it cuts from Tim to Tim to Tim, as you would expect. But then I started cutting between, from Tim to, to doors. And what happens is that people look for Tim, they see Tim, it cuts to a door, they know Tim's somewhere because they hear the violin and they know he's there somewhere, and so they go from here to Tim. And between the door and Tim is story, right? Or anything, or nothing. You know, but it basically gives you the chance to um, explore the movement from something to something else. And from there, you can actually guarantee, you Again, no guarantee I should stop trying to say that, but you can uh, predict uh, sort of where that range will be and then start planning things in, in that space. Um, doors are also great to cut to because they actually give you a reason as to why you may have entered into a new place as well. Uh, doors, windows, stairs, things that suggest movement or motion. Um, but then eventually I actually start cutting to like additional characters. Relationships with characters start to emerge because I cut from Tim to other people that you probably wouldn't have seen if you just kept looking for Tim. Um, at one point, there's a chicken, uh, which is my favorite part. Uh, and so uh, I think that's, there's something really remarkable about that. This, I, I have to, Robin Miller was the one, that one of the uh, Miss creators, uh, he and I talked about this. Um, this idea that he, he admittedly says he's a jerk because he'll go into a VR experience and then look the completely different direction. Like, he'll like, look at what people want him to look at and then just be like, no way and see what they do. And I actually started doing that too because it's remarkable how much people don't think about the rest of the space. They only see, the, they only see what's presented to them. Um, and I'm not saying that those people should be, I mean like, you know, the conversation generally comes to how do I force someone to look the way that I want them to look? And I think that is fundamentally wrong. I think you can compel people to look certain places, but you can't force them to do anything they don't want to do. That's completely disrespectful to the viewer that's in the space. Um, 
So what I do, or what I try to do, and I'm not always successful at it, but what I try to do is reward them. You know, it could be another part of a scene. It could be an alternate storyline. It could be a guy eating a cheeseburger, which, I don't know, could be me eating a cheeseburger. But it's, like, the, the idea is that if you turn around and you look, you're, it's not wrong. Um, and so what I did in this scene, which is um, Kennedy, who uh, is playing violin, albeit kind of poorly, in her bedroom, is this. Um, if you look at her, awesome. That's the point. You get it. There's a girl in her room, she's playing violin. Couldn't be more clear. But if you look the other direction, you see her parents grinning and bearing it from, you know, the doorway. And you hear her playing the violin, and you see the parents and the parents' response. I'd argue this is a better way of experiencing that scene than the literal interpretation of it. But if you look in either direction, you get the same kind of idea. There is a girl that's learning to play violin in her room. Um, and it was remarkable how much people actually really, they really appreciated that. And some actually were like, they stayed there. They knew she, she was behind them, but they liked this better. Uh, and surprise. So um, you probably see this a lot too. I do this sometimes. But um, you're in a headset, you get used to sort of seeing something here. And like sometimes you just need a kick in the butt. <laughs> like, hey, by the way, there's like stuff here. And uh, so occasionally it's nice, not all the time, unless that's what you're kind of going for is anxiety. Um, you can, uh, which is possible, um, you can basically have someone looking in one direction for, for a while. If you're feeling like they're kind of getting relaxed or they're not maybe moving around so much, you can then um, cut to something that's completely abnormal. Uh, in this case, I go from a ferry ride where there's a clear direction forward and then you get into a bike shop and then the directional sound takes you behind you again. So you reorient to yourself. Uh, and you saw this with the, the horse face too, so. Uh, movement. Experiences are layered. <laughs> there are multiple things happening. It's never really just this one clear thing. Sometimes it is. But generally speaking, there's multiple layers of action happening. Um, and this is in Paris. Who doesn't want to be in Paris during the summertime? You got kids uh, playing soccer, hitting the rig. Damn kids. Um, but the, but the idea is that there's, there's a lot of different movement going on. And, and you never end up in the same place as when you entered, generally speaking. Um, so I was saying this earlier. What's interesting about this, too, is that so in and out points in a traditional editing sense are out the door, right? Like you don't have in and out points premeditated by you. But what you can do is start thinking about attention points, where someone begins, begins in an experience where they're paying attention to or what they're paying attention to, how they're paying attention to at the beginning of that experience and the end. And from there, when you identify that stuff, you can actually start to uh, do this crazy thing where you actually reorient every world so that essentially you have a, it's like a cipher. You basically are able to go through and travel through this kind of crazy world. So uh, just to be clear, white is the, uh, is the viewer's decision and black is where they end up or where I understand that they end up. So once I know that they're there, I meet them with that, they go there, I meet them with that and so on. Um, and tension just because it's fun. Uh, this idea that um, you can actually put yourself, put them in a pretty precarious situation and it's actually kind of neat. It's not really an editing thing, I just thought it was cool. Um, okay, this, I think this is important. I, the guy was gonna kill me. Um, I understand the empathy machine thing, I really do. I think it's really important that we have experiences that we wouldn't have otherwise and connect with people we wouldn't normally connect with. I think that's, invaluable and it's important. That said, um, there is a fundamental difference between being at Google I.O. or a camera at Google I.O., which is this, where you know, essentially people are coming up to you and taking photos of you and they're kind of coldly looking at you, they're evaluating you, are you gonna work or not, I don't know, like basically being surrounded and objectified, which is what all tech is in, in a conference like that. Um, and being around the people that created you. This is the first thing I ever saw that, they, that came from the jump rig, which is what uh, the Google VR team is developing, um, or has been developing. It's what I use to film a lot of my stuff. And it's remarkable how essentially it's the same thing, but the, the feeling and the vibe is totally different. And I saw stitches that they did of like cherry blossoms and like a radio show. But this is the one that did it. This is so benign, 
like if someone said, uh, I want you to either film a rock concert or some engineers hanging out at some cubicles, like what would you choose, right? And shockingly, this is significantly better than a rock concert. Because this is acceptance. This is, I feel good, I'm loved, I'm taken care of. And that is so different than being somewhere where you are essentially kind of unwanted, a little bit objectified, like it's cold. Energy has a lot to do with these spaces. I would argue that the true empathy machine in this will be when you are actually a part of a community. Think more along the lines of that. And it's really easy to see the difference. You'll go into uh, someone who films at a refugee camp where the, where the refugees don't know why they're there, never seen that rig before, don't know what it is. And then you'll see one where that person has been there for a month, that camera's been around, someone from that camp is actually using the camera, is familiar with the camera. It's totally different. So I'm going to put this all together. There's, there's more, but I mean, it's, we only have like five minutes. So um, this is world tour, based on everything that I mentioned. Um, each of the colors signifies how much someone physically has to move. I do take into account how many, you know, people physically need to do something. We have to be cognizant of that. It's not just the mind. Um, so the red circles indicate if they have to move in like a 180-ish way. I don't want to do that too much. Uh, the blues are essentially just, you know, anything less than 180, just um, generally just, you know, experiences there. The greens are the complementary ones, the tunneling ones that I described earlier. And the whites are the chaos worlds. So it's sort of like identifying what the functionality of a world is, right? Like, what, that, what is that world supposed to be doing for, for someone? Um, to illustrate it better, I, I actually, I've never done this before. Not that you guys would know that, but um, I'm going to do a cross-section of it so you see kind of what I mean by this. So rocks for onboarding. And again, it's chaotic, it's meditative, whatever, but no, there's no expectation. Just chill out with some rocks, which are great in VR, by the way. In stereo, they're amazing. Um, and then the glacier climber, also onboarding, but it's a way for you to identify the 360 environment. Uh, the tram, which is uh, matching on attention, which we saw earlier with the horse faces and the, and the alleyways. Um, Arecibo, which is awesome. I've never been able to film Arecibo like this. I know it seems weird that I would film it multiple times, but it's my third time back, and it was really, really cool. Um, but this is, again, it's a breather. Like, you go through, if you go through some intense stuff, really think about the viewer. Like, are they, like, okay? Do they need some time? Like, what's... You know, maybe just give them a, a moment just to enjoy themselves. Um, the chess scene as a reorienting uh, scene because there are people concentrated there playing chess, so you reorient yourself there. Uh, boat for focus, uh, and then the bike for the surprise. Geyser, just to reorient, and then at the end, the glacier beach. And the glacier beach is really interesting because um, you, it's awesome, it's a really great place to be. Um, you don't have to necessarily see me fall on my butt on the beach to get it, uh, but if you catch it, great because you actually see why I cut to black when I do. It actually, the cut point is when Nick reaches down and grabs my hand and it cuts to black. So it's more like an Easter egg, I guess, if you want to think of it in a, in a game way. Um, so what's next? Uh, so this is interesting. Um, I've been working with the um, artists in machine intelligence, artists and machine intelligence group at Google. Um, and uh, something I'm really interested in is the way that artificial intelligence and virtual reality can kind of come together and do some cool stuff. Um, so this is something, I've been working with the Deep Dream folks um, on seeing uh, what's possible in terms of porting Deep Dream to VR. So we actually have some experiments in uh, the playground. Uh, they're very rough. We don't know what they mean. We'd like to keep playing with it and seeing what happens, but we, uh, we're, we're getting somewhere and we think it's really cool. Um, uh, and something else, which is a little bit of a downer, but I, I, felt, I felt privy to say this. So recently, my producer and close friend passed away, and this is Nick, um, and, uh, which is actually pretty recently, so you guys are helping me heal. Um, but the, the thing that I realized I was doing, because I have all these stitches of him, and basically him walking around with me and, and exploring kind of this crazy world with me, um, is uh, that I didn't do it in VR. I did it... Uh, in kind of a traditional editing sense. And I, I, I was thinking about it, I'm like, well, why didn't I want to do it? And I think the biggest thing here is that um, there is a, you know, there is a big difference between being present somewhere with someone, existing in a space. Um, there's a big difference between that and seeing something objectively on a screen. There just is, right? Like, we spend time stalking, so I don't do this. 
stalking someone on random social networks and seeing their photos and seeing all these different variations of who they are, but then when we're there with them, it's totally different, right? And I think that that's a really big difference and something that we, um, that, that uh, is, is something that we need to embrace a lot more. And a lot of the things that I've been showing you is based on that, just like being somewhere and what that means. But also, um, to go further a little bit, is, is the idea of, um, we talk about stereo, we talk about being able to move around the room and pick up a cup and slash a rock or whatever. Um, and yeah, because it's, there's depth. We love depth. We love being able to move through something. But, um, and maybe I'm getting a little hippie here, but like emotionally there's depth too. Consciousness has depth. Emotions and feelings have depth. Um, and being able to play with that depth and being able to understand that more I think is where the medium is. Like the experimentation is really less about the like kind of visual depth. I guess, you know, that's, that's it, it is important. It's surface, but it's, you know, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's fine. But I think that the, you know, we're missing the mark a little bit because we're not really targeting what's happening here. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think that um, that's something that I'm actually really uh, excited about is like, how do, we, how do we think more about consciousness? How do we think more about um, what it means to see through someone else's eyes? But like, really, how do we experience the world as they may experience it? And it's never literal, right? It's, it's always a little bit more figurative. It's based on experiences that they've had, memories that they've had. You know, we look, you know, you look at this and you see something very different than I do. And I think that that's going to be a fundamental difference between what you're seeing now and what you'll see in a year, two years, hopefully. Um, and so on that note, I am going to show you something that I've also never shown anyone because it's something I mean kind of after I started editing, where I thought about this like kind of world building stuff. Um, it's not very good. <laughs> So I'm not really expecting you to be like thinking it was amazing, but um, it's more to say like if it, it, it kind of was one of those things where I realized that the world stuff existed, I was like, well, then maybe if I put something together and sort of see things as worlds, it might, it might get, uh, make more sense to me. So uh, hopefully it helps you out. Can I, uh, volume? Louder? Why in the night sky are the lights hung? Why is the earth moving round the sun? Floating in the vacuum with no purpose, not a one. Why in the night sky are the lights hung? Oh, 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 oh. Why is life made only for the end? Why do I do all this waiting then? Why this frightened part of me that's fated to pretend? Why is life made only for the end? Oh, oh, oh. In the city only for a while to face the fortune and the bile I heard you on the radio I couldn't help but smile In the city only for a while oh. Hung. Why is the earth moving round the sun? Floating in the vacuum with no purpose, not a one. Why in the night sky are the lights hung? Oh, 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 Ha <laughs>
Uh, I write things sometimes, so if you're ever on Medium, I have like a lot of the stuff that I talked about today on there. Um, please feel free to follow along. I'm, I'm really interested in helping everyone make better stuff, so thank you. Thanks.